And so I want you to take a second and pause the video and think of the first animal that comes into your mind. Okay, now what is that animal? More than likely, it's something that is cute and furry, like a dog or a cat or a horse. Um, all of these would be considered vertebrates and mammals, to be more specific. But interestingly, only 5% of all the animals on the Earth are actually vertebrates. And there is a lot of diversity within Kingdom Animalia beyond just cats and dogs. And we're going to talk about some of that diversity um, in this lecture. And we're going to start with probably the, the animal you definitely did not think of, um, which is a phylum known as the periphera or the sponges. And so sponges may not seem like an animal, but they're actually the simplest animal. They don't have body symmetry, so they are asymmetric, and they spend most of their life sessile or not moving, but um, they do move at the beginning of their lives, and so that falls under that characteristic that all animals have of being motile. And <laughs> they're heterotrophic, right? And so they're able to eat other things as food, and most of the sponges live in aquatic environments. And so technically, while it may look kind of like a plant, a sponge is actually an animal and it's the simplest one. And so as we move up in sort of a more complicated or more evolved animals, we come to this uh, phylum known as the cnidarians or the kind of jellyfish. And so cnidaria, um, like I said, jellyfish fall into this phylum so do sea anemones, which you can see here in pink, as well as coral. Um, and most cnidaria are motile, like the jellyfish or the sea anemone. Um, some of them choose to be sessile for large portions of their life, like coral, but they do have a motile stage, um, and so they technically have that characteristic of animals. The cnidarians live in aquatic environments, and they have these specialized cells called cnidocytes, or stinging cells, that allow them to sting and paralyze their prey. Usually they're found in the tentacles of the sea anemone or the jellyfish. Um, and cnidaria actually have a primitive nervous system or neurons that can sense the environment as well. And so this nervous system is something that uh, sponges don't have. And as we move through this lecture, I'm going to highlight with the characteristics here on the left, basically something new that evolved in that phylum that wasn't seen in the previous one, right? And so stinging cells and primitive nervous system were not seen in sponges. There's something new and unique to cnidaria. And so cnidarians are, have radial symmetry or that sort of circular body plan. Um, and if we move into the animals that have bilateral symmetry, we're gonna start by talking about um, a phylum known as platyhelminthes, or the flatworms. And flatworms are not necessarily what you think of when you think of worms in the dirt. Uh, they are planaria and tapeworms. And so you can see a picture of a tapeworm down here and a planaria up here. Planaria are those worms that are regenerative, right? So you can cut them in half and they'll form two new worms. And what's unique about the flatworms, <coughs> especially as compared to the cnidarians, is that they have evolved um, basically a head or a concentrating of all of the nervous and sensory tissues to one side of the body, which is known as cephalization. And so here, this is actually a concentration of the nervous and sensory tissue in the planaria or its head, um, and it has these sensory eye spots there. A lot of the flatworms are parasites, and so this is actually a tapeworm removed from a patient. It's about six feet long. Um, and they require sort of these other hosts for their success. Moving up um, in terms of evolution, we're going to talk next about phylum nematoda or the roundworms. And so roundworms might be those worms that you are familiar with in terms of if you have pets. Um, roundworms and hookworms can infest the guts of cats and dogs. Um, and another roundworm that we've already discussed in the class is C. elegans, which is the model organism that can be seen here on the right. And so while the flatworms had this sort of cephalization or this formation of the primitive head, um, roundworms built on that and they have that primitive head and all their sensory organs located there, but they also have more 
a complicated nervous system, so neurons, and they have a complete digestive system. And you can actually see that here. So C. elegans is transparent. And that means you can see into the living animal without killing it. And you can see this bulb structure here is actually the pharynx or the part of the digestive system that grinds up food. And then this um, pebbly looking organ here is um, the intestine. In addition, roundworms have an exoskeleton or kind of an outside protective layer made of chitin. And roundworms can be found not just um, as parasites, but in all different habitats. And so the next phylum that we're gonna talk about are the arthropods or phylum arthropoda. And you can kind of think of these as the bugs. Um, and so phylum arthropoda includes all insects as well as spiders and all of the crustaceans, so like crabs and lobsters and crayfish. And some examples of arthropods can be seen over here. So we have this ghost crab, a lobster, a scorpion, um, as well as insects like ants. But the thing that's similar between all of them and that you can see in these images is that they all have jointed legs, right? And that's what arthropod actually means. So the joint is like straight or jointed and then pod for legs. Um, arthropods also all have segmented bodies, which is very easy to see on this uh, millipede here. They have an exoskeleton made of chitin, just like the roundworms do, um, but they occupy a lot more um, environments. They live on land, they live in water, they can live in the air. And these, this evolution of legs as well as segmentation um, are two things that were not seen in the worms, right? And the legs made them able to colonize more places more effectively. And so what's interesting is that, <coughs> well, in the beginning of the lecture, when I asked you to name an animal, you might have thought of something like a cat or a dog. 85% um, of animals actually fall into this category here of arthropods. And so there are a lot of different insects and a lot of different crustaceans they make up most of the animals that we know on Earth and that have been classified. And so maybe the next time you think of an animal, um, just try and think of one of these insects, right? Like so bumblebee or ladybug, because um, there's actually way more arthropods than there are vertebrates and mammals. And so moving on to the next phylum that we're gonna talk about um, is the mollusks or phylum mollusca and they are characterized by their soft body. So unlike the arthropods, which have that hard exoskeleton, mollusks have a soft, muscular body. And so some examples of mollusks are clams and mussels. You can see a clam down here, as well as um, snails and octopus and squids. So there's a picture of an octopus or image of an octopus up here, camouflaging itself really well and then as it stops, you can actually see its natural coloring. And um, in addition to the soft body, mollusks are characterized by having this muscular foot, which is what's actually protruding out of this clamshell. And that's what they use for movement. And so they can extend that foot out, bury down into the sand and pull themselves along. And in addition um, to a digestive system and a nervous system as is seen in those sort of earlier animals, Mollusks are the first um, evolved organism to actually have a heart and a circulatory system with like a true, um, true veins, arteries, and a pumping mechanism to pump blood through the body. Most mollusks live on water um, or live in water, like the octopus and clams, but there are several like the snails that can survive on land. And so moving up from the worms which had sort of a digestive system and a primitive nervous system and to the arthropods, which then had legs and a more complicated exoskeleton, as well as a more complicated nervous system, we now add in a circulatory system or basically arteries and veins, as well as a pumping heart in the mollusk phylum. And then um, the next phylum we're gonna talk about are like the true worms or the worms that you most likely think of when you hear the word worm. Um, they are fall into this phylum known as annelida or the annelids. 
and these are considered your segmented worms. And so you can see the segments here, just like an arthropod has segments, so do the annelids. Um, and earthworms fall into this phylum, so do leeches, which can be seen down here. And what's interesting is that these segmented worms have a complete digestive system, nervous system, a complete circulatory system that doesn't just have one heart, but actually has many hearts within the different segments, as well as a complete excretory system with sort of a primitive kidney that can secrete waste from the body. Um, they can live in different types of environments, but they are obviously much more evolved. Um, they have many more systems um, and they're much more complex than those other types of worms, right? The flat worms or the round worms. And what I just want to make sure that you're understanding as we pass through the lecture is that it's not that annelids don't have cephalization because it's not listed here. They already have, they do have kind of that primitive head structure where all the sensory things are organized on one side of the body. But in addition to that, they have these other things. And so every time we move through the lecture to the next most evolved species, it already has all the stuff I listed before. And these are sort of those new um, adaptations that have ar arisen in this particular phylum. <laughs> and so moving up, we're going to next talk about the echinoderms, which fall closest evolutionarily to the chordates or the vertebrates. And that might be surprising because when you look at an echinoderm, you don't necessarily think vertebrate or animal with a spine. Uh, because the echinoderms are your sea stars and starfish, as well as sea urchins and sand dollars. And so they have this spiny skin on the outside. It's one of the characteristics that they have. They have these evolved systems just like mollusks do, but in addition, they have a calcium skeleton on the inside. So an endoskeleton rather than an exoskeleton. And it's made of calcium, which makes it... Um, hard and provide structure to the body. And so mollusks have these complicated systems too, but they have the soft body with no support. And this evolution of an endoskeleton is similar to what we see in vertebrates, right? A skeleton on the inside. Um, and just a fun fact about echinoderms, they can easily regenerate their body parts. So now we've made it to the chordates, and for all intensive purposes, especially in Bio 101, almost every chordate is a vertebrate or has a spinal cord, a spine, and a vertebral column of bones. Um, and so you can think of chordates as vertebrates. And this includes sort of the more common classes of animals we're familiar with. The fish, the amphibians, the reptiles, birds, and mammals. And we're going to go through each of these classes in the next lecture.